Okay, guys, we're streaming, we rebooted everything, and this is one of the main things that bugs the heck out of me. We have everything in order with our, um, our YouTube channel, we have everything in order with our software, we have everything in order with the hardware, but it's that final link, and that's the link to YouTube, or in other words, the internet. Now, we've been waiting for two years for fiber, and finally, they told us that next week, they're gonna do the fiber connection. So that means that this is the final digital classroom for you guys that will be prone to problems with internet. Now, of course, then something else will probably happen because, hey, it's a live broadcast. So thank you so very much for tuning in. And, well, let's enjoy this episode of Digital Classroom. The only thing I wanna know from you guys is how is the audio? Is the audio okay? If so, just let me know and we'll start very, very soon. But of course, first, let me show you what you're watching. And we're back. Hey guys, thank you so very much for joining us in this live stream from our studio in Emmeloor, the beautiful Netherlands, where it's actually raining. So I would say the weather for today is not something like this, but more like this. Maybe even, no, it's really bad. So I hate the rain. So, hey, what are we going to do today? Now, a lot of you guys ask me like, hey Frank, I really want to do something that's easy to replicate and that I can do on location. For example, speedy portraits. That's actually the name we came up with. You guys just ask for, well, portraits that are fast, so that speedy portraits. But what we want to do, we'll, we, we actually took speed lights for today. So we're going to use the Photix Mitros Plus because the trigger is on the camera. Why do you need an extra receiver on the strobe, right? And then the Mitros Plus, everything is inside. So we're going to use the Mitros Plus and, of course, the Rogue Flash Benders because the Rogue Flash Benders are just an easy way to travel with. They're really small and, you know what, we're just going to show you in a moment. Now, one of the things from Digital Classroom is, of course, the interaction with you guys. So that means that you can ask me anything you like. I'll keep it civil because it's a live broadcast, but anything you like. Business tips, personal tips, uh, whatever you want to know, just ask me and I will try to give you an answer. So what are we going to do? We're first going to do a live stream from the set. That means that we're actually going to show you the light setup, how I make my model appear beautiful. And with Rosa, that's not really hard. She's already beautiful. And of course, how we make the shots. Then we're going to do the retouching part. I'm going to answer some questions from you guys. And of course, we're also going to do a photo critique. Yes. So we have some pictures ready and we're all ready to set. So let me see if there are any questions. So yeah, somebody tells me like audio is good image is a little bit dark. Your face is great, but around is a little bit dark. Well, it's all about the face, right? Now, I'm doing this from a webcam, so that's a little bit dark. The, the set will be fine, don't worry about it. I will show you the set very quickly so you can see that the set is fine. So there we go. That's camera one, two, three, four, and of course, my final camera. So as you can see, the set is okay. Okay, let's get back to my face. Okay, so are there any questions before we start? What, what is what you guys want to see? So we, we already got some images in like, uh, sorry, we got some questions in like, Frank, I would really like to see a setup where you use high contrast. So we're going to do that. But maybe you want something else. Well, today it's your game. It's your digital classroom. So just keep those questions coming in and we'll answer them any way possible. So anyway, do you have any questions on Facebook? Not yet. And do we have any questions on YouTube? No. First time I seem to be in time. Well, Nick, you are in time because we were late for the very simple reason, our crappy internet. But that's going to be solved, we hope. Okay, Anouk, are you ready for starting the seminar? Yes. Okay, then you have to take over my place. And there's Anouk. And there's the set. So Anouk. I know. Yes, you know. That's awesome. I love her. Okay, let's connect the camera. Today we're going to be shooting with the Sony A7R 3 It's an amazing camera, by the way. And of course, we're going to be using everything else too. So let me see if I can walk around and stand in front of the camera. Okay, 
Now, one of the things, guys, that I actually changed in my setup, and this is something that's really cool. Now, I love to shoot tethered. What does tethering mean? It means connected with your cable to your computer. Now, as you know, Anoweek and I are the distributors in the Netherlands for a company called Tether Tools. What is Tether Tools? Well, they bring you tools to tether. Duh. So it, it's a company that actually specializes in making it possible to shoot to your computer and everything else. So they give you tables, the big boy roller, which are wheels that you can put on your tripod. And they have something else, which I really want to show you guys because I love this product. And it's underneath my camera. It's actually called the Tether Block. Now, in the past, they actually had something called the Jerk Stopper. And the Jerk Stopper you had on your camera, on the side, and it gave you a direct connection to your computer, of course, without the, well, the fear that you would break your port, because those ports are really, really fragile. But it was still a little bit loose, and it worked. It worked great, and it's a very cheap solution. But this is the new Tether Block, and this is actually underneath your camera, and it mounts. It's an Arca mount, so you can also use it on your tripod, and it really connects that cable really, really tight. So this is one I really like. And by the way, the reason I'm not having a grip at the moment is that we're still waiting for the grip because this camera I love it but I still want the grip on it okay so what's the first thing you need when you do a model shoot you need lighting right well the lighting is here you need a backdrop we use the less to light backdrop you need a camera you need a lens you need a trigger and you need a photographer did I forget anything a model that would be really cool so Rosa are you ready yeah. Here she is. So, ladies and gentlemen, give a welcome for Miss Rosa. How are you, Miss Rosa? I'm fine. You're fine. You too? I'm very, very fine. Thank you for asking. Okay, so the first thing you have to realize is that with small strobes, you can, of course, use something called ETTL. Now, I'm not really a big fan of ETTL for the very simple reason. ETTL will always try to make something 18% gray. And we talked about it before, so I'm not going to do that again. But the metering in the camera is, to say the best, near usable. So in other words, it will never be perfect, but it will be near usable. So what I like to do is actually use a light meter. So let me grab my light meter very quickly and let's meter the light for Rosa at the moment. Okay. So are you looking forward to it, Rosa? Yeah. Of course he does. Course. Let's start out with this one. And I'm just going to place it straight in front of my model. So it's, it's just a normal flash bender. It's um, one of the things that I like about it is that you can actually bend them like this. That's why they're called a flash bender. And let's turn the strobe on. Now, the first thing you always have to realize, and that's what you can actually now, if they zoom in, you can see it, but I will just tell you, it's there's a channel and a group. Now, this one is on channel one, group B. This is very important because on the trigger, you also work with channels and groups. Now, what is a group? A group isn't necessarily one strobe. You can, for example, use a whole group of strobes, like 10 strobes, and use that in front of the model. That's group A. You can also use a few strobes on the back side, on the background, for example. That would be group B. And the cool thing is those two groups you can actually just control separately. You can even put one group on manual and one group, for example, on ETTL. And you can even turn one group off. don't know why you would do that, but hey. Okay, let's turn on the remote and the light meter. Now, the light meter is something that I really like to promote to you guys for one very simple reason. If you use a light meter, you always know how to set up your camera because, well, that's, that's actually what the light meter does. It shows you how to set up your camera. And the new ones, this one, for example, this is the, seven, oh, sorry, the 858. This one will also meter high-speed sync. Now, what is high-speed sync? Now, normally you are limited to a shutter speed of 125 of a second, sometimes 1 200 or 1 60, but you're limited. With high-speed sync, what it does is it actually pulses in 50 frames a second. And that makes it possible to shoot on a much higher shutter speed. Now, with the old light meters, you were never able to actually, well, meter that light. With this one, you are. So this is a really cool light meter if you do a lot of small strokes. Okay, so let's meter. And first, of course, we have to do a test. And there we go. And it would be nice if it worked, of course. But remember, group B. 
and I'm now on group A, so that's not smart. <laughs> let's go to group B. Okay. And let's just turn it down just a little bit. There we go. Okay, test. Okay, I'm at 4.09. Now let's talk uh, let's walk a little bit towards the camera. Let's see if you can see that. 4.09. Is that in frame? Okay, got it. 4.09, that's actually 4.0, so F4, and 9 tenths of an f-stop. So this is almost 5.6. Now, my light meter is set up on ISO 100, but I'm going to shoot on ISO 200. Do you want to know why? Of course you want to know why. With small strobes, recycling the batteries takes power, right? But also, the output takes power. Now, you can shoot on ISO 100, but it means that my batteries will run down very quickly. Now, in the studio... The lights you see now will be overpowered by the strobe, even if I'm shooting on ISO 400, for example, F8. But by shooting on a higher ISO, I can actually save my batteries, but most of all make the recycling of my strobes much faster. And nowadays, it doesn't really matter anymore, because ISO 400 is very clean, 200 is clean, and 100 also. So with studio strobes, I often shoot on ISO 100. With the small strobes, I like to shoot on 200 or 400. So 5.6, 4.09 on ISO 100. So that means F8 on ISO 200, because that's one stop more. Okay, so let's set it up on F8 and just make the first shot. Uh, Rose, can you look straight at me, please? Very nice. So I'm focusing on her eyes and then making the composition. And there we go. Now, the first shot you will see coming in is okay. Do we have a problem, Anna Week? Yes, you have the wrong screen on. Do we have the wrong screen on? Oh, yeah, I see. One moment. Let me change my screens very quickly. Sorry, guys. I know what she means. Mm. I'm sorry. It's because we can only mirror one screen. Okay. And there we go. I think that looks a lot nicer, right, anyway? Uh, yeah. Okay, then I also have to change my setup. Okay, one moment. Oh, one moment, guys. That's the nice thing and the cool thing about a live stream. Because I also have to see what I do, of course, cast desktop. It was also asking for updates. I cancelled that one. Yeah, always cancel updates during a live broadcast. <laughs> That's very smart. There are a few questions, though. Oh, okay. Well, let me first take some shots. Alcohol, preferably at the moment. A few shots. Yeah, you got it. Hey, we're Dutch. Okay, so can you look a little bit down? That's really nice. Love it. Okay, cool. Eyes up just a little bit. Wow, that's nice. Love it. Love the head. Really good idea. We were doubting about the head. I'm really glad we did it. Nice. As you can see, I'm constantly talking to my model. I just wanted to make her feel comfortable. But just be careful that you don't make her too comfortable. Because <laughs> then she starts to smile. Okay, and of course with everything you can walk around your model. By walking around your model you actually control your contrast. So let me see if I can manage this. Let me just look down a little bit. Nice. Love it. And this is also one of the things, by the way, that I absolutely love about this Lestolite background. Now, normally when you have a background you are limited with your width. And that means that if you walk around your model, you will actually see, for example, the studio, or you will see something on the sides. With the last light background, I can actually manage to get all the way here, almost under a direct angle, and I still have the background in. Only when I'm here, it gets a little bit more tight. So that means that you can have a lot of space around your model. You can even shoot full bodies. And of course, from the front, as you can see here, it's pretty flat. But this is a speedy portrait setup. And by walking around your model, you can actually maximize your setup and create some really nice, cool images with different kinds of contrast. Okay, Anna, anyway, you had some questions. 
Yes. Good morning from Guela Vista from California. Hello, California. How to prevent a blown out picture without the flash bender? Uh, if you have a blown out picture, use a light meter because then your picture will never blow out again. Next question, because it's always an exposure problem. If you blow something out, it's an off exposure. So it doesn't matter if you have a flash bender on or not. If a picture is blown out, it's an overexposure. And next question. The other question was from Guy. He wants to l- see some flags or gobos, if that's possible. Okay, flags and gobos. Sure, why not? Um, then we need an assistant at the moment, because I want to show you a, a flag very quickly, but I need an assistant for that, because we don't have it set up. But let's do that. Uh, Chaim, can you assist me with that? Okay, just take two. Now, in all honesty, I do have to re-meter for this, which I won't do because I just wanted to show you very quickly. Now, Chaim is a friend of us, and if you visited workshops, you already know him. Uh, Now, these are normally put on stands, and you can, of course, use cardboard, but I really advise you these. These are the Avengers from uh, Manfrotto, and what it actually is, is it's lightweight material, and you have a nice connector on the top, which you normally put on a stand, and then you can actually just move them around around your model. Now, what does these gobos do? The first thing you can do is, of course, block off your lighting so you don't have any lens flare. So, for example, let's say you have the sun and you have an older lens that is prone to lens flare. You just hold it on top of your camera, you shoot, and now you don't have any lens flare. Now, if you're a bad photographer or you have an ugly model, you can shoot like this. Works perfectly. Only all the images will look the same. Saves you a lot of time, by the way. But what you also can do is you can block the light. In this case, blocking the light will be very difficult. So who asked that question, Anouik? Can you block them for next time, digital classroom? (laughs) (laughs) No, I'm just kidding, guy. Um, Why is it difficult? Because at the moment I'm shooting with small strobes, and that means that I don't see any modeling light. But we're still going to try. Chaim, what I want you to do is I want to make a certain, let's say, line on her face. So what I want you to do is just move a little bit here. No, just... One or two? Uh, Start with one, so we build it up. So come, give it to me. And the first thing I want you to do is do this. Just hold it there. Let me see where now the line is, and you can't move anymore. Okay, now hold it up. Okay, I'm gonna shoot from the side. Let me just see where it falls. There we go, a little bit down. Okay, a little bit closer. And there we go. So I want those eyes to pop and the rest will be a little bit more dark. Okay, let's open up a little bit because, of course, it's taking away light. And there we go. Now what you can do, of course, is make it a little bit more like this. There we go. I'm I'm bending my friend. Okay, just move it up and a little bit that way. There we go. Can you still see the strobe from the top of your eyes? Yeah. Okay. Okay, now we have that nice flowing line on top of her face. Okay, now make it even a little bit more like this. And you keep your, yes. That's really nice. Okay, and of course I can also shoot from here, but then the effect will be a little bit less nice. So let's do it from here. Really cool. Okay. So that's what you can do with gobos. You can literally just steer the light. Now, in a perfect situation, which this is far from, we would, of course, also block the backdrop. Now, why did I ask him to do two? Because with two, you can actually make a line. But because I don't see any modeling lights, that will be very difficult to do now, and I don't want Chaim to stand very quietly like this. So we have to put him on stands for that. I'm not going to do that this time. But I can promise you, next digital classroom, we will do that with studio strobes. I'm going to show you gobos by then. Any more questions, Anouik? And the cool thing, again, about those gobos is that you can literally just steer the light. It, it's the same with using grids. So why do I like using grids so much? It's because you are in total control of your lighting. The lighting literally goes where you want it to go. And with gobos, you can, or flags or whatever you want to call it, you can literally just make it very nicely to do what you want. There's one thing that's very important that you have to remember. If you block it really close to the strobe, the effect will not be... I I probably think it will not be what you want, because it will be a nice, soft, 
uh, area around the shadow part and the light part, and it will just fade out. That's the same with when you use blinds. You put them straight up the strobe, it doesn't really work. So what you have to do, you make sure that there's a lot of difference, but, uh, dif um, distance between your strobe and the gobo or the blinds. Because the more the distance is between the strobe and the blinds or the gobo, and the less the distance is between your model, the sharper those shadows will be on our face. So let's put it this way, if the blinds would be like 50 centimeters away from the model, and the strobe would be on 50 centimeters, you will see a slight shadow, but if the strobe is like four meters away, then you will have those really nice harsh shadows. So that's actually how it works. So you, you, can, you can just play with it, make it softer, make it harder. It's, it's a very, very cool tool to play with. So next Digital Classroom, we do that. Yes, another question. Uh, it's from Jan Kruise. Hi Jan. Uh, is there already something you can use, a color checker fully compatible with Capture One? Okay. Um, there is a way to use the color checker in Capture One. Maurice de Jager actually did a video on it, but it's not as straightforward as you do it in Lightroom for the very simple reason. It doesn't support DCP profiling and there is no software for it. But believe me, with all the competition coming now out, there will be ways to use the color checker probably. But I, in Capture One, the way that Maurice showed it, it works. But for me, that's a lot of work. And the profiling in Capture One is pretty good. So if you just use a color checker, we're going to shoot one in a moment, to do your white balance, I think the profiles are pretty good. In Lightroom, the story is a little bit different. In Lightroom, I don't really like the profiles. For example, for the Sony cameras, they just lack color, and the color checker profiles are just spot on. So, Chaim, can you give me the color checker, please? Going to make one shot with the color checker. And... No, I don't. This will be okay. Okay? There's always one thing with the color checker row, so you have to make a funny face, otherwise it won't work. Yeah, oh, you know, one, two, go. Oh, I'm still on 5.6, so you have to do it again. Let's see, rocks. Awesomeness. Oh, you want me to throw it? I don't want to do that. Okay, now another thing that you can do with this one, and in the next setup we're going to use two lights actually, is create some contrast. So you saw me using contrast when I walked around, but we can also use contrast by using this, by just moving the light to the side. Now what I also want to do in this case, I want to have it a little bit more up. So I'm going to place the light a little bit more up and aim it a little bit down. This is why I love using these boom arms, because you can literally just aim the light exactly the way that you want it. I don't want it on the background too much, so I'm going to bend this. And that's why you actually, if you use small strobes, guys, really get those flash benders, because they are amazing. And of course, there's a flash bender called the Frank Doro flash bender, and that's the one you have to buy, of course, because that one is sublime. It's great. Right? Mm, right. Uh, yeah, yeah, right, right. Remember, your left is my right, right? Okay, let's grab the light meter again. Okay, and let's meter. 5.65. 5.65, that's almost 5.66, right? So the light meter works in tenths of f-stops. Your camera works in one-thirds of an f-stop. That means that 5.66 would be 5.6, one step up, and one step up, so you got it, 7.1 on ISO 100. So let's not make it too difficult. That's F10 on ISO 200. And yes, you have to calculate a little bit, but hey, that's okay. So let's go to F10. Okay, just look down just a little bit. First, I'm gonna shoot it pretty flat. As you can see here, now we have a lot more contrast, a lot more shadow, and it also makes the image a little bit more, well, looking muddy. And we don't want that. So when I'm shooting this flat on, it isn't really my preference, because I don't like it muddy. Okay, look that way again. And now just aim your eyes a little bit towards the light. Okay, now center your eyes. And up a little bit. Cool. So now, now you have that Rembrandt triangle. We love Rembrandt triangles, but hey, we're Dutch. 
Now what we have to do is just walk around the model and just create that hyper contrast look, which is really nice to do with the flash banner. So just look down. And there we go. And now because he wears a hat, you will see that something weird happens. Actually, only the head is lit for the very simple reason. That's the light. It's coming from above, so it hits it down. So how do you solve that? It's a very simple trick. Now, remember this. If you have a model with a head and the head takes away all the light, it's a very, very simple trick to solve this. Can you take off the head, please? <laughs> yeah. It's so easy. Photography is easy. <laughs> okay. Now, look down. Yeah, it's okay. She said in Dutch, like, do I look great? I said, yes. <laughs> Really nice. Okay, just look up just a little bit. And don't be afraid, by the way, to use your flip-up screen because that's why they are there for. And just use it from a slightly lower angle and get some really interesting shots because the background is also lit a little bit. So you can really get some cool effects. And the more she moves, the nicer it gets. I love that Rembrandt triangle. Really nice. That's cool. Awesome. And keep telling your model she's great, but not too much. That's nice. And the final shot, just look up a little bit. There we go. Okay, let's see what we can do with these shots in Photoshop. So we're going to go to the computer. There's a question first. Okay, then I will ask the question as soon as I'm there. And Rosa can switch over for the next outfit. Okay. So let me see the questions. Question on YouTube? Yes. Okay. Um, okay, let me switch to my webcam and the picture in picture. Uh, let's just do the whole webcam. Okay, Chaim is in the picture. Hello, Chaim. <laughs> that was a hint, friend? Yeah, yeah, that was a hint. Get out. <laughs> hey, okay. So the question is, uh, that's why you use strobes from Godox with Leon strobes. No battery problems anymore. Just use ISO 100. That's absolutely true. You can, of course, use Godox or Photix or whatever. Uh, the, the thing is, a lot of people still use speed lights, including me. And they're just really easy to transport. They're really small. And, well, just shoot ISO 200. And in the studio, that's absolutely no problem. It's, it's zero sacrifice you do. ISO 200 is just as clean as ISO 100. It's not, it's not 10 years ago anymore where you saw a distinct difference between ISO 400 and 100. Nowadays, that's, that's more than fine. Uh, let me see. Can you use a light meter also to set on ISO and speed you want, or how does it work? Uh, a light meter works exactly the same as your camera. So you can shoot it in uh, TTA, or sorry, in uh, time mode. So it will actually let you set the shutter speed and it will find the aperture for you. You can also set it in aperture mode where it actually fixes the aperture and gives you the shutter speed. Now, that's the cool thing about light meters. You can do it both ways. So it's exactly the same as your camera. Now, outside, when we do those day to night shots, what I actually do is I just fix my aperture and I will just find out the shutter speed which I need for the backdrop. Or I can just set my shutter speed because I'm limited to, for example, 125th or 160th, and it will give me the aperture. So it's, you can do it both ways. It's, it's really easy to work with. And by the way, with the light meter, don't overthink it. it. It's a tool. It's a very, very simple tool, and it just works. And it doesn't make you a better photographer. It just makes you much, much faster and more accurate. Uh, let me see. Uh, good to finally be part of one of these sessions. Hello, Patrick. Uh, the Godox are lion-based small strokes like the ones you're using now, but 600 flashes on full power on one Accu. Yes, I know you're a big fan of Godox. I love it. <laughs> but with the small strokes we're using today, it's, it's really easy to travel with. They're really small. And I also use the Photix Indras, which also do like three or 400 pops on full power. And they're 500 watts, so they're really nice. But they're bigger. And... For now, for, for this setup, uh, because you, you combine ETTL, manual, you can zoom with them. It's, it's just easier to do it with small strokes. But uh, uh, th there are many, many solutions out there that are better in some cases and are worse in others. What, what I like about the mitrosses is that when we travel, we just throw them in a bag and they take up the same space as a camera body. 
So th that's just really, really nice. Okay, so about the light meter, let me just show you very quickly because we actually have some videos, of course, for you guys. And in, in between, we have to set everything up for the Photoshop part. And one of the videos we created is actually about the light meter. So make sure you check it out. Hey guys, my name is Frank Dorov and I'm the author of the book Mastering the Model Shoot. Now, you guys really like the book because we're getting a lot of rave reviews on Amazon and every other online store. So that actually triggered us to make a video series about the book. Now, in the first video, I will tell you everything about the light meter. Now, in digital photography, I think the light meter is the one thing that confuses people a lot. Uh, shouldn't I use the histogram, Frank? Isn't there a meter inside the camera? Where do I point the meter? Towards the pretty girl? Towards the camera? Towards the light source? Where? There's a lot of confusion out there. Now, in this video, I will give you in more than 70 minutes all the insights out about the light meter. Calibrating, using incident and reflective, uh, using a white background, how to keep details in the black, how to trigger the meter, uh, where to point the meter. You will see everything very easily explained, but you will also see photo shoots, including our model Manon. This is one of the videos if you're slightly interested in the light meter, or if you already have a light meter and you want to know everything about it, get this video. It's called Mastering the Model Shoot, the light meter. And it's the first video in a whole series that we're going to release in connection to our book, Mastering the Model Shoot. And it's available now from our website. Back. So make sure you check out that video and you can actually get all the videos. I will show you very quickly the link on frankdorf.com slash videos. And there all our instructional videos are there and they're really, really nice. Hey. In the Dutch we have a saying, wij van wc eent. That actually means that we promote our own products, but hey, whatever. <laughs> okay, so let's go back. Okay, let's take a look at the pictures. But first, Anouik told me that we have some questions from Facebook. So let's do those first. Yeah, it uh, answered himself. What oh, he answered himself. <laughs> what kind of flash can he use for Canon? He has two... Uh Okay, what kind of flashes can I use for Canon? Uh, the cool thing is, now Canon has this system called the RT series, and the RT series has a display, and it's a really, really cool system. Don't get me wrong, I love them. The thing is that when you switch over to Photix, you pay a lot less money, you have the same display settings, and in all honesty, they work a little bit easier than the Canon system. Now, when you first look at the strobes, they look a little bit more flimsy. The Canons are really like, they're built like a tank. But in the end, we travel around with them a lot, and I'm careful with my stuff, but still they get bumped around. And the Photixes up until now didn't break down, and they work flawlessly. And the money you save, you can actually buy almost for, let's say, two Canons. You can buy three Mitros Pluses. But the biggest advantage for me compared to, for example, the Ying Yu or uh, Yong Yo or whatever the name is, is that the triggers are in, uh, sorry, the trigger of course is on the camera, but the receiver is inside the strobe and that saves you so much hassle with batteries and we're just figuring out which one doesn't make connection. So I really, really like those Photix strobes and they're really small. If you want slightly bigger, of course you can go for Godix or my personal preference. And I think that's the wisest step to do is actually go to the Photix Indra system because you have the small strobes. So those are really, really compact to travel with, really small. They just run on uh, AA batteries. And you have then the Photix uh, Indras, which are just a little bit bigger and you have a battery with them and that gives you 500 watts. And in the studio, you can use an AC pack and just shoot with them in the studio. If you want even bigger, 
you don't need to go any bigger because those also work in the studio. So that's a killer system, the Indra. Make sure you check it out online on the Photix, the Indra system. I think a lot of people will actually dig that a lot. Let me see if there are more questions. Um, we have a uh, message retracted. Oh, I'm always curious what that was. What brand is the light stand with the boom arm you use in the shoot? We always use Manfrotto stands. So unless they break, then it's another brand. No, I'm just kidding with you guys. We love Manfrotto. So those stands we use in the studio. And a week. an impact. Actually, really? This is not a Manfrotto. Oh, and that's the only stand which isn't a Manfrotto. So if Manfrotto is listening, don't you laugh. That's not nice. No, don't. That's an impact. So, sorry. No Manfrotto. But every other stand in our studio, we just love Manfrotto's, except, of course, the stands we use from Ellingrom, the Polish stand. I'm making a mess out of it. Let me put it this way. If you're looking for stands, buy the Manfrotto's. Manfrotto has a similar stand, but we're still using the very, very old ones we still got, and those are the impacts. But Manfrotto all the way. <laughs> Any other questions? I'm so sorry, guys. But, hey, it's live. Uh, okay. Um, other questions? No. And we, do you have a question online? No. no. Okay. Let me first do the selection. Now, I leave this camera on so you can actually see my expression when I see an image. Um, okay. So, we're using Capture One because Capture One I really like because it, it has a really fast tethering solution. So, I love Lightroom. Don't get me wrong. But the Capture One is just a little bit better for what I do. It's shooting tethered and just having a really, really fast way of seeing if an image is in focus. Like, for example, if I double click on it in Lightroom, it doesn't matter how fast the computer is. It always takes time to render. Now, look at this. Boom. And we're done. Okay, Frank, that one was preloaded. No, because if I take a new one, it will actually take one or two clicks. Oh, that one is actually out of focus. Oh. Okay, let me take this one. And there you see, it's just as fast as the previous one. And here we go, boom, and it's sharp. So that's way faster than you can ever do with Lightroom. Now, I really like the shot. I don't know why, but I like it. This one is okay. Oh, we're having a problem. Because I like them all. Okay, that one I don't like. This one I love. That one is okay, okay, okay. Not, not really, wow. I love this one. And, oh, by the way, let me, let me talk about that one in a moment, because I already flagged it. Now, these are okay, but they're not really stellar. And I really want some images that pop. Okay, here we have those images with the gobo. That's always fun to do. Oh, this is, this is pretty cool. Now, let me see if I got the focus right there. Yep. So let me see what we can do with those. And of course the color checker. Okay, now we have the high contrast shots. And I really love this one. I'm not gonna retouch all, don't worry. I'm just gonna retouch a few. Uh, I still like this one. Okay, so I sort on rating. So that means that all my ratings are now in the front. So now when I look through the images, I still like this one. But I like that one more than this one. And th the reason is I both have those shots with her hand like this. And then I just pick the one that I really like, and that's the one I'm going to retouch. Because I don't want those images to look too similar. Okay, I love this one. And why? It's a very, very enthusiastic shot. She, she really laughs, and it, it's an... Let me put it this way. You can normally pose a model and go a little bit more to the left, a little bit more to the right. That's it. Oh, keep it that way. Don't move. Don't do this. But if a model just laughs and it's a totally spontaneous shot, what's better than that? I really, really like that. Okay, this is the one with the gobo. Now, because the gobo took away some of the lighting, of course, you have to bump the exposure just a little bit. But in this case, that's okay. Okay, I really love that shot. Okay, the color checker. So what do we do with the color checker? In Capture One, very simple. You just go to your white balance picker. You pick one of those. Now, some people ask me, why not one of these? Well, very simple. These will give you a little bit more red, or as they call it, a little bit more warmth. And these are actually for landscapes, giving you a little bit more green in your neutral white balance. Now, if I say neutral white balance, I want neutral white balance, and I don't want white... Uh, sorry, I don't want green or red in it. I want neutral. So that's why I picked these or that one. One of these three, they're all about the same. Okay, so let's start off with some images for retouching. Uh, let me first take that one out. 
I'm actually going to take this one and this one will be gone because those are very, very similar. Okay, I'm going to pick one of these and let me just take this one. And I'm going to do this one with the gobo and one of the high contrast ones. So we're going to do three shots. Okay. I'm going to do it really fast. Now, Rosa has a beautiful skin, so I don't, I don't really need to do any retouching on her skin. But I do have to get them into Photoshop. So let's go to Photoshop. Now, what I do in Photoshop is actually a TIFF 16 bits uncompressed Adobe RGB. And that's, in my opinion, the best way to retouch your images for the very simple reason. You have a TIFF, that's a high quality image. You have Adobe RGB, white color space. And, well, 16 bits, you really need that if you start working on your images. Okay, so let's open up a Photoshop on the right monitor. There we go. Okay, now the first thing you will notice is the face of uh, Rosa. That's really, really nice. So I don't need any retouching on this. But just for the sake of it, I'm going to show you what we do for retouching. So the filter I love to use is actually image-nomic portraiture. And it really is a great filter for smoothing that skin, as you can see here. Now this is on the nuclear setting, so this is way, way too much. But I found out that during many years that I've used this plugin, I actually started using it on nuclear and actually just take the effect out. So in other words, you don't use it on full blast because that's just plain ugly, as you can see here. But you just take the effect out. The reason for this is very simple. There are always areas where you would like it on full blast. So you have to run it again. So why not just run it on full blast straight from the start and just paint it in at, let's say, 50%. And then at that point where you want it 100%, there you just build it gradually up. So that's the way we're going to do now. Now, it's on the top layer. And as you can see, it's way too much. So go to Layer, Layer Mask, Hide All. So we're going to take everything out. Take a brush with white paint and just put it on 50% and just paint the effect in. There we go. And it gives it a nice glow. It doesn't really change anything to the image yet. It just gives you a nice and softer look in her face, which is often preferable for, for example, beauty portraits and even fashion. As you can see here, it just gives it a little bit more. Okay. Now what I want to do is I want to take this part out the shadow. And in Photoshop that's really easy nowadays. You just take your lasso tool and you just select it and you press the delete key. Oh, sorry. First layer of that image. Press the delete key. Now you see content aware, normal, and just press OK. And as by magic, and I love magic, everything is gone. I forgot a little part, so I had to make the selection actually a little bit wider. Sorry for that. So just do that with the healing brush. There we go. Okay, now of course I want to give my image its soul. I want to give my image the look that I want. So what are we going to do? Now, in the past we used a lot of DxO film pack and alien skin exposure. I still love those. Now, if you don't know what those are, those are actually tinting programs. So you can give a certain look to an image. And at that point, well, that's the look you can store. And for example, you can call it film look or Riala or Portra. Those are film types. And at that point you can actually just use that over and over again. Now, we recently switched also to something from Skylum called Luminar. Now, the next series I'm going to do with Alien Skin Exposure because those two literally just balance between what I use. And then when I use a really cool film, a film pack use, that's when I start using the DxO. Because DxO is still, in my opinion, for the absolute film looks, DxO is still the best. And well, they all have something else that's cool. And anyway, we have a question from Facebook. Why not exporting a PSD file to Photoshop from Capture One? Okay. Why not export a PSD file from Capture One to Photoshop? For the very simple reason, in Capture One you already have one layer. You don't have two layers. Unless, of course, you add layers in Capture One, then you can export it as a PSD. But with a normal image, it doesn't make any sense to do it as a PSD. If you want to do it as a PSD, no problem. Just do it, because they're still the same quality as a TIFF. Don't do JPEGs, because JPEGs should be forbidden. That's very simple. Okay, so what I do now is I just go through my looks, and I'm going to see which one I like. And I actually already like this one. But let me put it a little bit less sharpening on. There we go. 
as you can see, it really, really changes the whole shot. I really like this. Now, of course, these presets are already built by me to use. So that means that I already, of course, have my look in here. If you use the standard boxed presets, well, you still have to change a lot because it's your style, right? And I'm just going to go to some presets. And by the way, you can buy these presets very soon on our website. Let me give you the address for the presets. And we sell them pretty cheap. We sell them for like 10 euros. Now, on the presets, never pay more than 10 or 15, maybe 25 euros for a preset pack. Because in essence, you can make them yourself. It just takes a lot of time. And we already have a lot of presets on there. Okay, I think I'm going to go for the first one because I really like that. There we go. Okay. Now, of course, you can always change stuff. Like if you want a little bit less highlights. And maybe just a little bit more in the shadows. And there we go. And I do have to save this one. And let me just do FD 80s look open. And the reason I'm going to save this because I have more images from the same series. And I want those images to look all the same. Press apply. I did miss an update, so I'm still using an update that's a little bit, well, it can crash, and hopefully it won't, but you never know. Okay, there we go. It's running the filter, and there we are. And this is actually all I do, layer, oh, I don't need to flatten image, file, close. Now, the cool thing is, because I did one that I really like, the next one will be very, very simple. So just take this. I have to open up just a little bit to make it look the same. There we go. Just open this image. And now see the speed. I want to open up the eyes just a little bit. So I'm going to take the dodge tool. I'm going to go in. Okay. Only do the irises, never do the eye white, because that looks really, really creepy. And because aliens, oh sorry, because a portrait can actually be run in an action. So what I created is just a duplicate background with the name smooth, run portraiture, make visible and make a layer mask. So what it actually does to make it simple is just press play and it will now run image normal portraiture. It will create a layer mask and it will give me the right brush. So the only thing I now have to do is just paint the effect in again. We start at 52% for Rosa. Now, if you have a model that has a, a, a worst case scenario skin, you can set a brush, of course, on 100%. And then you will have a really, really nice smooth skin. But with Rosa, we'll just leave it on 52. We don't need 100% anywhere. Just do layer, flatten image, filter, Skylum. And now you can actually straight go to the setting you just stored. So in this case, it was the 80 looks open. So categories, custom, uh, 80s open, and just press apply. Now, a lot of people ask me, like, how long do you actually retouch? How long does it take? Because I take hours or two hours or three hours. As you can see here, it goes really, really fast. And at that point, well, it's very simple. Every minute saved is a minute you don't have to spend behind a computer and you can do other creative stuff. Or watch a movie or play some games or whatever you want to do. Okay, so this is this. We're going to do the high contrast one because we're going to make a really stunning black and white version of that one. And by the way, now I see some problems in her skin. So let's just go in and just take that out with the healing brush. There we go. Really nice. And take some stray hairs. Now that I'm in there, just, that sounds weird. But I just take out some other stuff too. There we go. Don't overdo this because you don't want a Barbie doll. You still want a model. And there we go. File close. Okay, let's go to that high contrast portrait. And that's this one. I really like this. Let me see if I can open up the, sh no, don't open up the shadows. Okay, press go. Because I want to show you some other stuff with this one. Because we have a lot of stray hairs here. 
And how do you remove that? Well, in this case, I don't mind it going black. So what I'm actually going to do is I'm just going to select this. And I'm going to use content to wear fill to fill it in. There we go. Okay. But you also see some other hair. So do you use the healing brush or do you do something else? Well, content to wear fill is a really cool way of taking out stray hairs or other stuff that you don't like in the picture. So what you can also do is actually go to your brush, go to your quick mask, and now just paint over, make sure that it's 100%. Paint over everything that you don't like in the shot. So if you don't like your neighbor's dog in the shot, just paint it over. And then many other people, of course, you can take out the shot. Okay. Okay. Now, you have to be careful, because this I also want to take out. So for this one, I'm going to go in 100%. And it can be that this doesn't work, and then I'm just going to tell you that I do like it. Okay. And that's why we don't use the lasso tool now, because this is way more accurate. Okay, let's take it this. Okay. Now press here. Now make sure you do the following, otherwise you have a big problem. Select inverse. Otherwise it will take a long time and only those hairs will still be there. And now just press delete and use content aware film. Let's see how it works. Now of course you can do everything with the healing brush, but as you can see here, this just works way better because now I can only take the healing brush and just go in and clean up. And cleaning up is always faster than doing everything. And literally, content aware film has come a long way from being like a nice gadget that worked sometimes to something that actually works most of the time. There we go. I'm not so happy with the eyebrows, but hey, we're going to make it black and white anyway, so why not? And you remember what I told you guys many, many digital classrooms ago. If you mess something really up, just make it black and white, add a lot of noise and contrast, and you have instant art. So don't worry, we can always go back to black and white. Okay. Nice. So this looks way better than with all the messy hairs. The only thing I don't like is this, this part. The the connector for the flash bender. So let's make that whole. So let's just select this part. Okay, and use again content aware fill. We could call this the digital classroom with content aware fill. And there we go. So that's way better in my opinion. Nice. Okay, let's make this black and white. Now for black and white, I still absolutely prefer alien skin. Because alien skin is just so incredibly cool with black and white. So I just go here. As you can see, it's already on black and white. Uh, let's go to uh, my user settings. Let's see which one I like. The cool thing is I can just set one up. So I just click on it and now I can just use my mouse and go over all the other ones and it will just render that image. And as soon as I move my mouse to the middle, it will show you the one that I selected. So you can very easily do an A to B comparison really fast. And again, fast is the way that I love it because that saves me a lot of time. Oh, really like that one. Again, I want this high con, this one, this is the one. Okay, let's do a before and after. Really nice. Okay, I like the grain. It's not too much, but I still like it. And press apply. The only thing that bugs me is this little part in the backdrop. So we have to take that one out. Cool. Layer, flatten image, and just go up and just take that one out. Nothing more? No. Okay, file and close. And save, yes. Let me go back. And as you can see, we did those images really, really fast. And 
in all honesty, it's, it doesn't take you a lot of time to do this this way because everything is automated, you know exactly what you already did, so why spend more time behind the computer than it's absolutely necessary, right? Just use your filters, use your plugins, and most of all, make sure that you have that workflow in order. Now, if you want to know more about Capture One, make sure you check out this video because this one is all about Capture One. Great shot. Hey guys, I'm Frank Doroff. I'm the writer of the best-selling book, Mastering the Model Shoot. Now, during my workshops, I get a lot of questions about people. What about raw developing? How to set my camera? Do I need Adobe RGB? Do I need, do I need sRGB? There are many questions out there. And the best thing to start with is use Lightroom and Adobe Photoshop. That's where you start. But after that, if you want a little bit more quality, if you shoot a lot of tethered setups, Capture One is actually one of the best programs out there. It isn't the best in library modes. It isn't the best in map modes. That's where we still use Lightroom. But Capture One is an awesome RAW developer. Now, what is a RAW developer and why is it important? Think about the old days when we had film. The choice of chemicals and the choice of film made a huge difference. The same film developed in different chemicals gave you totally different end result. The model was still the model, the landscape was still the same landscape, but you get more definition from one chemical. Or you get a little bit more detail or a little bit different colors, also depending on the process. And that actually is the same thing for the new digital sensors. A digital sensor records a raw image. There's no color space attached to a raw image, it's the raw image. You have to attach a color space yourself. This is also one of the most heard problems during, for example, social media stuff. How do I set my camera? If you shoot JPEG, choose sRGB or Adobe RGB. If you shoot RAW, it doesn't matter because the RAW file is the RAW file. There's no color profile attached. That's what you do in your RAW converter as soon as you go to JPEG or TIFF. And most workflows, of course, will be TIFF 16 bits because then you have a lot of stuff to work with and then you can use the bigger color spaces. But hey, I'm getting way ahead of the stuff. I don't want to teach you too much because this is a promo for a new video I created. Now, next to Lightroom, one of the most famous and best known RAW developers is, of course, Capture One. And Capture One has had a turbulent experience for me. It started when I shot medium format, I needed Capture One. And now when I shoot Sony and even when I shot Canon, I quickly found out that the raw developing of Capture One was awesome. But a lot of people have a lot of questions about how does it work? With Lightroom, I know how everything works, but how does it work in Capture One? And that's why we created this video for you guys. It's a total walkthrough about how I set up Capture One to work with Lightroom and Adobe Photoshop because those are still my main programs. Capture One is used for raw developing and it does such an amazing job at that. So, check out the video on Capture One Raw Developing Workflow from me, Frank Doroff. And I'm sure if you have any questions about Capture One, they will be answered in that video. Hey guys, and welcome in our studio in Emmeloord, the Netherlands. My name is Frank Doroff, and I'm a fashion celebrity photographer, but I'm mostly focused on teaching workshops. Now, one of the most important things I always stress to my attendees in the workshops, color. Make sure you use calibrated workflows and make sure that your monitor is correctly calibrated to what you retouch or what you photograph. Because in all honesty, if you shoot something in the studio or on location, you want those colors to appear exactly the same on your monitor, right? Now let's take a look at my setup. We have the Wacom Cintiq 27 inch. Love retouching on that one. 
and we have the new BenQ SW320. And that's a very special monitor. Now, why is it a special monitor? It's a 4K monitor. That means it has a very, very high resolution. It's also Adobe RGB. And you get this really cool hood with it. Now, why is that important? Because it takes out light that falls on your screen, especially in darker areas, but also in lighter areas. If you have light hitting your screen, you can't do a proper adjustment because, well, in the shadows, light will actually make sure that you don't see those shadows. And of course, you want to make sure that you do see those shadows because that's where your detail is. Another thing that's very important and that has, well, all professional BenQ monitors have this is hardware calibration. Now, calibration is important. You put a little device in front of your monitor and it meters different squares. For example, red, green, blue, cyan, magenta, but it also meters your grayscale, so black to white. And that color analyzer creates a profile called an ICC profile. That profile is handled by the computer and makes sure that the reds are as close to perfect as possible. But this monitor, like many other professional monitors, support hardware calibration. So that means you don't use the profiling all based on software in the computer. You still have an ICC profile, of course, but you actually do most of the calibration inside the monitor. And that gives you way better gradients. So in other words, the small differences between colors, the very nice subtle nuances, are much better presented on a monitor that has hardware calibration. Okay, so 4K. Is it just the rage? Do you need 4K? Do you need 5K? Do you need 8K, 16K? Do you need it? Yes and no. If you're a photographer, it can be a problem. And you know me, guys, I'm always honest to you guys. And I'm not somebody who will just say, oh, it's a great monitor. It is, but I also, also want to teach you guys a little bit about do you need it. So if you're just doing photography, do realize that if you have a 4K monitor, and before that you had a full HD monitor, on a full HD monitor, if you zoom in on your images, you will go like this. Vroom. So you will see only the eye of the model. If you do that on a 4K monitor, you will zoom in a little bit less because there's way more resolution. That can be a problem. However, the scaling in modern monitors are, is really good. So that means that you can actually not zoom in to 100%, but for example, to 200%. So that's not really a problem. The really cool thing is when you do video editing, because nowadays full HD is no problem at all. If you use Resolve, Premiere or Final Cut X, you can just watch the full resolution preview on that preview area in your editing software. You can still see all your tools and you have plenty of room to move around, so no more scaling artifacts. That's great. If you edit 4K video, you can't of course see it full screen, but you have way less um, scaling artifacts for the very simple reason you're watching it on a much higher resolution screen. And then, if you look at the monitor itself, the design, great. But it's not all about the design. What I want you guys to see is actually the desktop. And you see that some icons are appearing a little bit small. Make sure that in your operating system, you now find the zooming options. In Windows, you have a zooming option. In Mac, you have a zooming option. Make sure you use those because otherwise the letters will be really small. And this is one of the problems of 4K displays. Because you have this insane resolution on a smaller display like a 32 inch, some manufacturers of plugins are still a little bit slow. So that means that some plugins, if you open them up in Photoshop, will appear incredibly small. So tiny, tiny letters. So you really have to to look, make sure you have great classes. Is that the fault of the monitor? No, of course not. It's the fault of the manufacturer of the plugins. And luckily, a lot of those guys are already working on plugin updates like Topaz, Alien Skin Exposure, um, ImageNomic Portraiture. They all have versions where you actually don't have those small letters anymore, but where you can scale the interface or the letters are adjusted to the high resolution displays. Overall, if you're in the market for a great monitor and you want to make sure that your colors are correct and that you don't have any problems with, for example, scaling artifacts when you're doing video editing, make sure you check out the BenQ monitors. We've been using them for quite some time now and overall they never disappointed me. The thing that surprises me always with BenQ, and this is something that, that that's why I'm one of their ambassadors, is price quality. 
You can spend a lot of money on monitors, but in the end you need performance. And performance is really easy measurable. You can just do a calibration and after that you do the so-called proofing of that calibration. And then you get numbers, we call it DE numbers. And there you can see how perfect your monitor is. Why spend 3000 euros for a monitor if you can do it with a lot less? Because the proof of the monitor is very simple in metering. And this monitor did it perfectly. So over time we will still have to see how it is with color uniformity and degradation of the monitor. But in all honesty, the BenQs never ever let me down. Great monitors. So check them out. I highly recommend them, especially if you're like me, very picky about your colors and love high resolution because it's gorgeous. Thank you so very much for watching guys and see you next time. Without a doubt, BenQ monitors, two thumbs up. Hey guys, so welcome back. Um, we have some questions which we first can to answer. Now, why are these commercials? Very simple, it's a live stream and in between I also have to get something to drink and of course maybe also get something to drink out. If you know. Right. Okay, so anyway, um, let me see. Does a light meter give you the same value if you use a reflective or incident? No. It will give you the exact same value if you meter an 18% gray card. But a reflective will always give you the value for 18% gray. Incident, that means in front of the area you want correctly lit, that gives you the setting for your camera. So reflective is everything is 18% gray. That's great for calculating, for example, if you still see details in white, three stops up, uh, three stops open, or if you still see detail in black, four and a half stops down. Now, incident you use for proper exposure. So for example, if you want this part of your model to be correctly lit, you hold the light meter in front of that area, you take uh, the light meter reading, and that's the setting you actually use for that model. Okay, let me see. You can set up the quick mask by double clicking so it selects directly the selection and you don't have to invert it. Good tip, learn something again. That's the cool thing, you can always learn stuff. Isn't it still possible when you shoot tethered in Capture One to get the picture on the computer and on the card? Uh, Paul, that has never been asked before. Yes, it, <laughs> a lot of people ask this and I, I will give you my real honest opinion. <laughs> If I shoot for a client and it's really, 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 let's go, really, really important, that's when I have a card in my camera and as soon as I lose the connection to the computer, it will actually start recording on that card. Capture One doesn't allow you to shoot to the computer and on the card. Now some people will go like, that sucks. It doesn't. Bear with me. Why should you shoot on the card and on the computer? Well, because you want to have a backup, right? Okay. Why not just set up your computer that as soon as something comes in, it also stores it on a second hard drive? Because you make the selection in the computer, your client gives flags. So in other words, in the computer, a lot of stuff happens. You, you take out images, so you, you give other names to images. So if you have your card with all the images and you have your computer, on your computer you will miss images because they're deleted, because they're out of focus or they're black. You have images that have a flag, you have images that are rated, maybe you have images that have different names. And how do you combine that? So it's better to set up your computer to store it on two separate hard drives and at that point just use it like that as a backup. Now what I like on location, is actually these. These are the rocket drives from Lassie, and hey, they're orange. <laughs> We're Dutch, right? How many times do I say I'm Dutch? Let me give you a competition. If you know how many times I said, hey, I'm Dutch in the last month, you can win a prize. So you have to go through my whole YouTube channel. Okay, that's not fair because we have a lot of stuff. Let me put it this way. If you know how many times I said, hey, I'm Dutch in this episode of Digital Classroom, you can win something and it's not a Lassie drive. I will have to figure a price out. It's just to have fun. Okay, so these orange drives are really cool. Now in the studio, we have something else when we shoot tethered and that's actually, I'm gonna pick this up so don't get seasick. We actually have this, the two big dog. And this by the way, don't, that's a rocket blower, nothing else. So this is the two big dog and there are actually two drives in there. And this is, I believe the 16 terabyte version, that one is really, really fast. It has a card reader on board. It has a di mini display port, Thunderbolt 3, USB. It's an insanely cool device, so make sure you check them out. Uh, I even have the bag here, and this was not planned. Or the box. 
So let me see. One moment. There we go. So this one, highly, highly recommended. Love this. And it's, uh, what do we have? Let me see. Du Ports, the Thunderbolt. Du Porte, the Thunderbolt. Let me just not do that. Uh, dual Thunderbolt 3, USB 3, on off switch, very handy. And of course, your power, you have a, a Kensington lock, really cool for on location, and display port. And the drives are hot swappable and it's aluminium. So that's really cool. And I'm never going to do French again. Okay, any more questions? Um, just wondering why flash benders are so much more expensive than umbrellas. They don't seem to lie way more complex to produce. Yeah, well, in all honesty, umbrellas I use for the rain. And I don't use it for strobes. And I tell you exactly why. You can't do what you do with the flash benders with an umbrella. I never saw an umbrella that you can really focus and bend and do stuff with. An umbrella is a totally, totally different modifier. A flash bender is really something that's flat. It's really, really lightweight. You can bend it. It has a beautiful uh, option to make a strip light or a softbox out of it. And the strip light you're going to see in a moment. You can use grids for it. Totally different product. It's like comparing <laughs> apples and oranges. So totally different project, totally different uh, style of shooting. But umbrellas are cool. If you want flat lighting, use an umbrella. I don't like it that much. Okay, Anouy, do you have any questions from Facebook? No. No questions from Facebook? Okay, let's go to the set. So Anouy is going to take my place again. And we're going to go for the next set. So I'm going to switch over very quickly to my setup with the set. There we go. And of course, Rosa, are you ready? Yes. Ooh. Oh, she's a French. See? So now I have to speak a French. Francois, Francois, whatever. I'm not really my French. Pardon my French, as they say. Okay, let me take this one out. I need my trigger. One moment, guys. Because we want to meter the light. Wow, that's tight. There we go. Okay, so the first light I'm going to set up is actually this one. Now, in for this side, I want that really nice Rembrandt lighting. But I'm also going to use an accent light. So we're going to use accent lighting and we're going to use the main flash bender on front. So this is a setup that a lot of you guys requested. So this is going to be it, I hope. Okay, now the first thing I want to make sure is I don't want any light spill on the background. So we move the background actually a little bit further back. So I'm going to ask my model oops, to come a little bit more forward. Now the cool thing about the Rembrandt lighting is you have to make sure that the light hits the model from the back because you want that real nice triangle, right? That's the Rembrandt triangle, so that's the triangle of light. Now, by the way, if you look at painters like Caravaggio, which I really advise you to do, he was way before Rembrandt and he had an amazing style of, I almost call it photography, but of storytelling. So make sure if you're into that old, old painter stuff, also check out Caravaggio. Not Carapaccio, that's something else from a pizza, I believe. So move a little bit forward. There we go. Okay, really nice. So I'm going to shoot that from the back. And let me first just set up this. Okay, so the light meter again. Now some people will say, Frank, it takes a lot of time to meter everything. Uh, yes and no. I'm, I'm sure that if I use a light meter, I'm actually 100% sure that my images always are exposed correctly. And in the end, if you do it fast and you're used to it, the light meter actually doesn't slow you down. It actually makes you faster. Okay, so channel B. Okay, 4.08. This is actually pretty good for this. But let's just give it a little bit more power. Okay, so this is 5.6. Okay. First shot. And we're first going to get that Rembrandt triangle in. So I'm going to put it on my camera again. Okay. Turn on the camera, that helps a lot. And can you look down just a little bit? There we go. Okay. Okay, this is a little bit too much. As you can see, we have a really dark side and we don't see that Rembrandt triangle yet. It's a really cool shot. We need that Rembrandt triangle. Uh, Rosa, can you step one step backwards? And then do the same thing. So she, take, she took a little step. 
And now we already see the Rembrandt triangle, by the way. I'm still shooting, by the way, on ISO 200, so that's why you see a different aperture. Okay, just look a little bit more that way and just tilt your head like that. Yes, there we go. Stunning girl. Chin up. Okay, and there we have that Rembrandt triangle. It's a little bit too much, just move a little bit towards me. Very little and a little bit that way. Perfect. Let's do the same thing. And this is really, really just inches. Inches moving around and making it perfect. Okay, well, looks pretty good. I'm gonna close down just a little bit in my aperture. So I want a little bit more of a darker look. Really like this. The only thing is, on the side, I think it's a little bit too dark. So we're gonna use an accent light for that. Now, as mentioned before, I really like those flash benders from Rogue for the very simple reason that you can create different modifiers with it. Like for example, this one, without a doubt my favorite, is and maybe we can move the light stand a little bit because I think that's in the middle of the frame. Yeah. There we go. As you can see here, what we actually created is a strip light, including the grid. So we have a really nice narrow beam of light on my model and I can really put it where I want. Now, where do I want it? I want it on our jawline. I really like Rosa's jawline and I really want to enhance that. So let's do that. Just gonna turn this one on. And because everything is done by a remote control, I don't have to do anything else. I just aim it towards my model. Let's do it like this. There we go. And this is a little bit of guesstimating because I don't have modeling lights at the moment here. Okay, do the same thing. Look towards the light. And there we go. Okay, now Frank, why didn't you meter that backlight? Very simple, I see my backlighting and my accent lighting a little bit like cooking. I really wanna just aim in what I like. And if I use ratios or if I start to meter it, you very quickly go to, okay, you meter it, it's always like this, or it has to be a ratio on one on two. But for example, with a fair skinned model and blonde hair, maybe a ratio of one on two is way too much. But on a dark skinned model with dark hair, maybe a ratio on one on one isn't enough. So that's why the backlighting, I always like to do a little bit like, just go with the flow, just see what I see, and just if I like it, it's okay. Let's look a little bit more up again. Really nice. Make sure that you look straight ahead, so your eyes are approximately there. Okay. I'm gonna change the camera to ISO 100 and make it a little bit more moody. As you can see, I'm now forgetting everything that I metered. For a very simple reason, I'm now creating a look. And the light meter was the perfect setup to start with. But after that, I'm totally free, of course, to do whatever I want. Photography is an art form. It's not something that's dictated by rules. You can just change it, chin up just a little bit. Awesome, that's nice. Eyes towards the light. And just move your eyes towards here. There we go. Otherwise, you will have the walking dead eyes with a lot of eye white. And we don't want that, of course. There we go, so I really like this. I like it a little bit more strict on our face lighting wise, a little bit more bright, and then it's really nice accent lighting. The cool thing about the flash bender, and this is what you can't do with an umbrella, is that if I want a little bit more light on the background, I can actually just move this out of the way and just bend it and just see what happens. Hence the name flash bender. And now you will see that the background will actually get a little bit more light. You see this? And this really gives you separation in your lighting. It's a really totally different way of looking at your image. Okay, let's go to the B channel and just give it a little bit less to make it more moody. Mm -hmm. As you can see for the model, this is pretty boring because you can only do one thing. And a little bit more. But if you nail the shot, then you have a really nice shot. And there we go. So I, I really like this. Now, of course, what you can do now is start playing with your model. Now, I, I let my model look up all the time, you know, because of that a cat's light in her eyes. Now, you always have to remember there's something called angle of reflection is angle of incident, meaning in Dutch, hoek van inval is hoek van uitval. So angle of reflective is angle of incident. What does that mean? It means that if you shoot somebody with glasses and the light is here and your camera is here, you will see the reflection in the glasses. But if you place your light higher, the reflection will be there and will go under your camera so you won't have that reflection. 
Same goes here. I actually have my light up a little bit too high because my model has to look up and she has that Beretta, Beretta? Okay. Beretta, whatever. She has a hat on. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna lower my light slightly and that makes it a lot easier for Rosa to catch the light in her eyes instead of not. I'll just move it a little bit forward. And I'm gonna play a little bit more with my lighting. Okay, cool. Okay, I have to lower the output. Again, we can do this with a light meter or just do it like this. And in this case, I don't mind that I do it manually. Okay, as you can see, the background is now actually dark again. So what do we do if we want the background lighter? Very simple. Just aim the strobe slightly towards the backdrop. And you have total control. You control the lighting, don't let the lighting control you. It's something I love to tell people for the very simple reason a lot of people are so afraid of controlling that lighting and if they see something and it doesn't work the way they want, they panic and they go like, oh, it doesn't work. Don't worry, it will work in the end. Just make sure that you know what your lighting does. Okay, let's move a little bit here. Okay, look down again. And now look straight at me. You can see this gives you a more split lighting, which I don't particularly like here. But if I move over here, can you look straight at me? That way, cool. You get something like this, which I like a lot more. Now just open up a little bit. Okay, and now I'm changing my setup again. Can you move that way a little bit? And eyes towards me. Really nice. Cool. That's cool. Okay. Now, that backlighting, that of course I can also use for something else. Let's do a little bit of lens flare. But in between, Anna Week, you had a question? Anna Week? It doesn't matter really. It just is what you like. A again, photography is an art form. Don't let it be dictated by rules like you have to light two eyes or you have to light this. There's one rule that I live with, and that's the front eye has to be in focus. Even if the front eye is in total darkness, I always want my front eye to be in focus. Now, sometimes if you watch TV shows, like for example Star Trek or whatever, sometimes they're shot so fast that the focus puller makes a mistake. So you see, for example, Captain Kirk speaking with Spock. And then you see that the, the, the hind eye is actually in focus. So they're framing it from here, and that eye is in focus. That drives me absolutely nuts. It, it really takes me out of the story. So I, I always try to get that front eye in focus, because that's your attention grabber. Now, if something is totally dark on this side, and you have light on that side, your brain will still know that that's in focus if the light fall off goes like this. So how do you focus on something that's so dark? It's a little bit of a trick, just focus on the point of the nose. Because if your brain sees that the point of the nose is in focus, and the eye is a little bit out of focus, it will calculate the eye is sharp. So that, that's my only rule. The other rules are very simple. Your own personal preference. Some people love black and white, some people hate black and white. There's no right, there's no wrong. Just do what you like. Okay, let's move this one a little bit here. And let's see what we can do with some cool lens flare. And I want to do the same shot as before. So just look straight at me. There we go. Nice. That's so cool. Okay, let's move that. Eyes towards me. As you can see, the more that I move around, the more intense I can get that lens flare in. Now, if you're more like, oh, I want to see that lens flare, use that flip-up screen again. And just use a lower angle. There we go. That's a little bit too low. Okay, keep your eyes towards the light. So look here. Uh, a little bit here. Okay, cool. That's nice. Awesome really cool. Wow. Okay, do something with your hands in front of your face or with your face. That's cool. Chin down just a little bit. 
As you can see, I'm just using my flip-up screen. Of course, you can bend down and do something like this. It looks incredible. You see all those videos online, the, the, the amazing photographer that is actually a ninja. But you know what? I do this almost every day. I just use the flip-up screen because that saves my back. Cool. Thank you so very much. And let's see what we can do with Photoshop with these images. Give it a certain look. And of course, answer some of your guys' questions. And we're going to do the photo critique. Don't forget that. Okay, and do you have any questions on Facebook? Uh, no. Oh, okay. Okay, let me see if we have questions on YouTube. Um, Oh, let's go here. Um, okay, I have some images here. And let me take that one out. And you have to be pretty intense with the, uh, sorry, not intense, but you have to be pretty strict with this. If you see an image that you're never gonna retouch or you don't like, just delete it. It only takes up hard drive space. Okay, here you see that I missed part of the eye, so that's an image I will never ever use. This one is okay. I never delete images that are okay, by the way. Because you never know. Here you can see exactly what I mean. If you look at this image, you can see that it's like a walking dead image. You see that a lot of eye white and only the iris there, so that's something that I don't want. So I want my model to look a little bit more like this. Here you can see that it's much, much better. I like the images, by the way, with the backdrop in, so that's why I'm not selecting any images yet. There we have The Walking Dead, and this is the correct one. Nice. There we go. I love this one. It gives it a really cool look. And these are a little bit too dark. But that's all adjustable, of course, in a Lightroom or Capture One or whatever program you use. I didn't like that split toning. Uh, sorry, that split lighting. I do like this. And you see what a difference it makes if she just pull up her chin just a little bit. I love this one. This one is not so good, so take that one out. That one is too bright. I like this one. And there we go with the lens flares. I really love lens flares. Hey, that's no secret. I think if you follow my work, you know that I have a thing for lens flares. These I don't like per se because I don't see any cat slides in the eyes. So I'm going to take those out. There we go. That's better. But it's too much face. This I really dig. Not going to retouch them, but I still like them a lot. No. No. Mm, not really. I, I think the angle is a little bit too low. It's a little bit too much in the face, or sorry, in the nose. And that's one of the rules, by the way, that normally I break that rule, but in this case, don't. Okay, so let's do this one. Now, the thing with small flesh is that we actually moved around just a little bit, so I'm going to open up everything just a little bit. There we go. Okay, let's go into Photoshop, and let's see what we can do with this one. Uh, pen. First thing we do, of course, is do the skin. So we have that filter for that alien, uh, sorry, uh, <laughs> image normal portraiture. And again, with Rosa, we just use it on 50%. That's more than enough for her. I'm actually always inclined to not do the skin on models like Rosa because they already have that cool skin and it looks really nice. But somehow when you do it, it always looks a little bit nicer if you do. As you can see here, it just takes the edge off. So in that case, it's okay. okay just zoom in. And because we're using high contrast lighting, you now see a lot of these little irregularities that I want to take out. There we go. If you have any questions in between, Anna Week is monitoring Facebook and I'm monitoring YouTube. So ask whatever you guys like. And we'll try to give you an answer, of course. Okay. 
this is okay. Now, for this one, I really like to dive into alien skin exposure because I like a more vintage look for this one. And th this is, by the way, um, Luminar from MacFun, uh, uh, now Skylum, by the way, in the early days it was MacFun, is really great. But I think if you want more subtlety, Alien Skin and DxO Film Pack still rule the pack for film looks. I really like Luminar for the more colder looks, but this I want warm. And somehow uh, the enhancements, like in, what I like to use on the Mac was actually MacFun Intensify. And that's in Luminar. So Luminar is like a, a setup. Where you, on my YouTube channel, there's actually a video where I explain to you guys what Luminar does. But it's like you can build your own preset. So you can use sharpening or dehaze or whatever. And you can just plug it in like you're playing with Lego. You can just create your own plugin. But the overall looks are always a little bit, for me personally, towards the colder looks, the cool looks. As soon as I want to create a more warmer look, Somehow I find it better to do that in alien skin. So that's why actually at the moment we are now in alien skin to do the more warmer look. As you can see here, I really like this. And I hope what you see in my images when I tint my images is that it's actually not extreme. Some people will, and I always say they Instagram the heck out of a shot. So they really make it like, oh, we're going to do this, and we're going to do this background. and we're gonna Don't. Don't. Just do it very, very subtle, like you shoot it on film. Just give it a little bit of a tint, a little bit of a, a hint of difference. And that really makes the shot for me. Let me see if there are any more in between. Nope. Okay. You guys are quiet today. Let me just zoom in. Now you can really see what it does. Gives you a nice little, al almost like a grain look, which I really like. And just look at here. Wow, it really makes her eyes pop. Okay. Cropping wise, normally I would crop it just a little bit tighter, but in this case I like the barrette. Or barretta. No, that's a gun, I believe. No. In this case, don't. I like I like it a little bit wider. Now a lot of people ask me like why do you and I, I will show you that by the way, why do you crop so tight? So why not leave some part on top? I can show you very quickly. Now with the with the bird in the deed, oh, whatever. I won't do it, but let me just imagine that she doesn't wear a hat and just crop tight. Look at this. It really draws you into her face. It really draws you into the picture. While when you just show everything, it it just takes me a little bit out of the picture. I think also that's why in movies they use the three quarter shot, the close up shot, and the further away shot. Because that close-up shot really draws you in. When I come closer, it's important, you know? And when you take a picture, it's a still. So you have to make sure that you really grip that attention of the viewer. Now, this part really bugs me. But with hairs, it's always a little bit difficult to make that nice. So what I will do is I will create a duplicate layer and we'll just take it out. But if I see that it's not okay, and in this case, it's pretty okay. It does a pretty good job. If it's not okay, I will actually just leave it in because it's not that bad, but it's something that did catch my eye. And one could say, if it catches your eye, it's bad to take it out. And I agree. But if it doesn't work and make the picture more ugly, don't do it. Okay. File close. And yes. Oh, sorry. Layer, flatten image, file close. Okay. Let's do one more, and then we're going to do the photo critiques. Uh, let's do this one. Okay, open up. I'm going to show you something else that's really cool about Alien Skin. So do portrait smooth. Okay, take the brush again on 50% and just paint the effect in. I'm going to show you also a trick for taking away those bags under your eyes. Now, do remember that there always is a little bit of backiness under her eyes because, well, that's how human beings are. So don't take it out completely, but what you can do is just create a duplicate layer, take your healing brush, and just take it out like this. So you take it out 100%. Okay. That's awesome. Now take your clone tool and make it like a 10% coverage. Just select something here and just massage it a little bit lighter. Okay, 
So now you have before and after. Now what you do is you just mix those together. So this is too much. And just do it like this. There we go. <laughs> Makes it way more natural. Do a flatten image. And now, of course, the eyes we want a little bit more pop. So we go to the um, dodge tool. Just give the eyes some pop. There we go. And now go into alien skin. Now, I already have a lens flare up here on top. I want to have that a little bit more enhanced. And this is where I absolutely adore alien skin. Now, watch this. I like the look, so I'm not going to change the look. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go to my overlays. And I'm going to go to lighting effects. And let me go to all. And just go through... Okay, one moment guys, let me see if I can make this a little bit bigger. Oh, that's weird. Normally I run it on another monitor that's a little bit bigger, but okay. Doesn't matter. So let's see. No, that's too yellowish. This is way too much. I love this. This is really nice. And you can even zoom this effect. Now you can't move it around, which I don't like. I, I would love that you can move it around. And just edit a little bit. There we go. I really like this. You can change your multiply, which in this case, no, I think. Let me see. That's okay, but it's not cool. You can use overlay. Nope. Or you can just use hard light, which in this case, no. So we're going to use the normal screen. There we go. And again, you can see before and after. And I think it's now a little bit too much. So just uh, pull down the opacity. There we go. And just press apply. Now, the lens flare was already there. So I'm actually not cheating. But it just enhances it a little bit more. Because the original lens flare, it's okay. But I think it, ca it, it can use a little bit more to spice it up. Okay. And then we have some cool image layer. Let an image and file close. Okay, let's do some photo critiques from you guys. But first, I have to take a drink. So we're going to show you something really cool. We recently released a brand new instructional video. And this video is something you guys asked for a lot. We want to see something of the basic of lighting, the Frank way. So here we go, the essential lighting techniques. My name is Frank Dorhoff and I'm a fashion celebrity photographer based in the Netherlands. But most of all, I love teaching you guys about photography. Now, what is the main ingredient of photography? The model, of course, your camera, but most of all, lighting. Photography is painting with light, telling your story with light. And so light is the most important thing in photography. But still, 99% of the photographers let the lighting control them. While in essence, you as a photographer should be able to control the lighting. And that's why this video is created. It's a video about the essential lighting techniques, the lighting techniques that you should learn. How to create a white backdrop or how to create a black backdrop. How to make sure that there's still shadow in your lighting. But most of all, how about the essential lighting like Rembrandt, butterfly, feathering your light, making sure that your model is lit the correct way. In this video, we're gonna do all those techniques and way more. Very simple tips about how to control your shadows. We talk about light meters. We talk about my favorite plugins. If you're a starting photographer, this is the video for you. This is where you learn everything you need to know about lighting. And after that, you can start telling your story with great lighting. If you're a professional, I'm sure there are a lot of tips in here that also help you. So enjoy our new instructional video available now. Hey guys, welcome in the Netherlands, Amsterdam. This is my home country and my name is Frank Dorov. If you want to learn more about studio photography, the first thing you have to understand is how do you build your own studio? There are so many problems you will encounter during the building of your studio. The size is too small, the size is too big. What do I do with the walls? And the list goes on and on and on. In this class, I will give you a lot of tips about how to build your studio. But of course, I will also show you some cool tricks with lighting because that's of course 
very vital part of your studio. So check out my class on building your studio on Kelby One. New York, without a doubt, one of the most beautiful places in the world for street photography. In this video, Beyond Snaps New York, we're not only gonna show you tips and tricks about gear, getting great shots, uh, locations, how to talk to people, and much, much more, but we're also gonna show you some places that you may or may not have heard of of New York. How about two Chinatowns? You probably know one. We actually found another one that's way more interesting. How about a location where you can get great, great night shots? Or Jay and Silent Bob's Secret Stash, Amityville. This video is jam-packed with not only photography tips and techniques, but also great locations to visit when you go to the New York area. I'm sure you're gonna enjoy this video. In my opinion, it's one of the best we ever made. So enjoy Beyond Snaps to New York. Okay guys, make sure you check out those videos online. Okay, and you see the thing is here. Oh, and by the way, if you're interested in Luminar, make sure you go to our special community website page, frankdorf.com slash macfun, which we actually have to change into Skylum very soon. And of course, subscribe to our YouTube channel. And now it's time, you all have been waiting for, of course, for the photo critiques. So let's just switch over to my desktop and the computer. Mm, there we go. And let's just pick randomly three images in my bag of images. And there we go. Okay. Cool. First image. I don't know from who they are. It's called the Eye of the Tiger. I really like the shot. I really like the expression of the guy. It's an amazing, amazing shot. Very, very cool. But let's make that a lot better. So the first thing you want to do is open up the eyes. So let's take out your uh, dodge tool. Oh, it's already on 100%. Okay. So let's take out the dodge tool. And let's just do the mid-tones at this case. And just open up the eyes. There we go. Really like this. Now what I'm going to do is I want to make this more raw. I want to make this really like, it has to be an eye of the tiger, right? There's a little trick for this. Now, go to layer, go to new layer. I'm not going to use any plugins because I want you guys, let, let me change this camera very quickly like this, okay. And a little bit more, uh, Casey Neistat style. There we go, awesome. And now I have to focus, of course, which is ridiculous with a webcam, but anyway. Okay, let's make a new empty layer. Go to the bottom layer. Now we only see three colors, red, green, and blue. So that means in Photoshop you have three channels, red, green, and blue. Now in this case, let's take the red channel and go to edit. Uh, sorry, select all, edit, copy. Of course you can use short keys, but I want to show you in menu. And now go to layers, go to that top layer and do edit, paste. Now I don't have a black and white version on top. I have the red channel on top and I'll do the following, soft light. There we go, now look at the difference. Now this is way more rough, this is way more intense. I really, really like this a lot more. So let's do a little bit of tinting for this. So if you do something like this, I want it a little bit more bluish. So go to, uh, let me do layer. Let's go to adjustment layer. And let's go to curves. And just go to the blue one and add a little bit of blue to the shadows. There we go. Take a little bit of blue out of the highlights. There we go. Go to the red channel. Take a little bit of red out of the shadows to make it more blue and add a little bit of red to the highlights. There we go. So if you see now, this gives me way more intensity in the shot, a little bit of cross-processing, and it's, for my personal opinion, this is a little bit better. But of course, it's all, it's your shot. So if you like it the way it was, just leave it that way. I'm just gonna give you what I would do. Okay, cool shot. The problem is, probably you didn't use strobes. Now, why didn't you use strobes in this? Well, maybe you did, but look at the face. The face is a little bit too dark. You don't see any cat slides in the eyes. I do like the shot on itself. It's really nice. I love the backdrop. And, well, there's not much to complain about the shot. Cool girl. 
But let's just open up our face just a little bit and make sure that the attention of the viewer goes to the face. So we're going to make a separate layer. I'm going to select her face. There we go. I'm going to feather this a little bit. Select, modify, feather, and don't do it 600, but let's say just do 25. There we go. Now what I want to do is I want to open up that side a little bit with my curves. Oh, opens up another monitor. Sorry, guys. So let's just open up with curves. There we go. But now what you do is you actually now invert this, select inverse, and you do the same thing, but you just lower the opacity. And there we go. Select, deselect. And now, it looks like you shot it with strokes on her face. The thing is, on the top it's a little bit messy, so do this. Layer, layer mask, hide all. Oh, sorry, edit, undo. That was my mistake. Layer mask, reveal all, of course. And just make it with a soft brush around her face, just a little bit more smooth. There we go. Maybe give a little bit in the sky. Okay, so now it looks a little bit more like you use strokes. Is it perfect? No, so just lower the opacity to zero. Just gradually build the effect in. You can make the backdrop really. Oh, somebody destroys my studio. Of course, it's my wife, but you guys already know that. There we go. So before and after, I think this is a little bit more in, in, in sync with um, what you would see. If you use strokes, and yeah, I actually like it. And of course, you can see the before. Let's do the history brush really fast. And uh, this is the before. So edit a new after. Ah, it's okay. But I like the shot, by the way. I like the pose. You see both hands. She looks straight into the camera. Uh, I, I like the lines here. Now, a lot of people will probably complain, like, okay, why didn't you go any lower that the horizon will be a little bit lower. I, I don't mind it in this case, because I love to see the different colors of the of the sea or lake or whatever it is. But really love it. And this part, uh, sorry, you can't see that. This part, uh, the stones really give it some intense, um, some, uh, you know, uh, uh, let me put it this way. I just like it. Okay. And this one, now, what can I say about this shot? This is just freaking awesome. Love it. I love the way that this just flows down on her shoulder. Uh, I can't read exactly what's on her uh, shirt, but it, it's something cool. I love that her eye just seems totally in focus. I love the backdrop, uh, uh, sorry, the front drop in this case. And those little uh, thingies, great. What can you improve? Well, crop, just crop it a little bit. There we go, do it like this. Gives it a little bit more intensity into her eyes. There we go. Just a simple crop, nothing more. This is perfection as it is. Don't change anything. Really, really cool shot. Whoever took this, congratulations. That's really awesome. Let me see the time. Oh, we have time for one more. Let's do one more. Okay. Let's do this one. Uh, okay. What I would do actually is rotate this. Uh, counterclockwise. There we go. I like it, um, but I like to see more light fall off. It seems like a little bit of a Wonder Woman. Um, how should we do this? Okay, let's do this. Layer, L uh, new layer, and just go to a layer and go to soft light. Go to fill with neutral gray. That's an extra option here. And now we have a layer that does absolutely nothing, as you can see here. It, it just doesn't work. Okay, so let's take your, don't do the lasso tool, do the quick mask. Make sure that it's on 100%. Okay. Let's make sure you only hit her face. Okay. And a little bit behind. Okay. Select inverse. Select modify feather. Let's do this. 50 pixels, cool. And now just take a paint bucket with black and throw that in. Okay, it looks a little bit better for me because now I actually have the attention to the model. 
Now, if you say that's too little, just do it again. There we go. That's much better. Okay. Cool. Layer flatten image. But of course, if you do something like this, you also want the focus to fall off because you, you like the, the eyes in focus and the rest a little bit off. Now, Photoshop has a really cool filter for this. This is actually under the blur gallery. Let me see if I still have audio. Yes. Uh, and that's called, let, let's do it with tilt and shift. I really love tilt and shift for this. Just put it on our eyes and just rotate. Don't overdo it. This is something that you can really, really destroy an image by, by just overdoing it. So do the blur a little bit less. A little bit more. A little bit more. Let me just turn it, because I want this part a little bit more in, in unfocusedness. Is that a correct expression? Probably not. But her hand has to be in focus. Okay, I have to choose. In that case, just do it like this. That's better. This is a little bit tricky. There we go. And now because the focus is always easier to do when it's on full blast, you just take it down a notch and just press OK. There we go. And th this gives you way more that sense of movement. Now, also here, I love to see that red effect. So do a layer, new layer. And again, I'm not using any plugins for this. This is all standard in Photoshop because I want to be showing you guys something that you can also do. Oh, sorry. Uh, normally, new layer. Okay, go here. Go into your channels. Do the red channel. Control A or Command A on the Mac. Uh, Ctrl C or Command A on the Mac. Go to Layers, Ctrl V or Command V on the Mac, and just go to Soft Light. And there you go. I think this just works better for me. It, it's a totally different image, don't get me wrong. It's totally different from what it was. But it just gives me a little bit more of that sense of wowness. Of, you, you know what I mean, right? I don't even know wowness is the right expression, but, well, you know. Okay. Yeah. Compare it to the original one. Image rotation. Ah, anyway, you, you know what I mean. Undo. Yeah, love it. Okay. Uh, let me switch back to this camera for our questions and announcements. Annemiek, do we have any more questions? Not on Facebook. Not on Facebook. Okay, so I have this whole list here that I have to go through, and it's really fast. Make sure you check out Photo Days in Belgium on March 9, 10, and 11. I will be there for Sony and probably also at the La C booth. I don't know for sure yet, but for Sony I will be there. Then we have the best show in the world next to Photoshop World. And that's actually professional imaging on March 24, 25, 26th. It's in Nijkerk and it's without any doubt the trade show in the Netherlands to go to. I'm on the live shoot theater. We have our own booth. Uh, a lot of our friends are there. Lassie, BenQ, Sony, Wacom. It's just a smorgasbord of really cool people. You can meet the channel and the speakers. I can't tell you yet who they are, but I'm responsible for the speakers and trust me. There are some amazing speakers. And this year, we're going to do something about uh, something um, with styling. And Nadine and me are going to co-teach that on the live show theater. If you've never done that before on a theater, it's going to be freaking awesome. So make sure you go to Professional Imaging. They still have an early bird till uh, January 31st. So make sure you check your tickets there. Then for the Dutch people, we have a workshop, Elep in Eindhoven, at 14 and 15 April. Just go to our website and you will find information about that. We have a new Ultimate Weekend, that's a workshop in English. It's two full jam-packed days, including dinner with our team and the whole group. And that's on May 4 and 5th, the day after I'm having my birthday. So make sure you come there, because we're going to have a freaking birthday batch too on the May 5th. In May, we're also going to be in the UK with Nadine. So make sure if you want to go to the UK, just drop me an email, because we don't know any dates yet. But just drop an email if you want to be in the UK, because the UK always sells out like crazy. 
So make sure you don't miss your spot. And then in June, same thing. We didn't announce it yet, and it's already half full. Photoshop World, pre-con, but also a workshop in New Jersey at New for New Cake Studio, just like last year. And we're again going to bring Nadine. It was such a... The responses from you guys were just awesome, so we're going to bring her again. And next Digital Classroom, of course, is on February 28th. Now, if you have any questions, please leave comments below. Smash that like button because we really like that. <laughs> and, of course, subscribe to our channel. But most importantly, tell other people about it because that's how we grow our channel. My name is Frank Dorof. I would like to thank you so very much for watching, guys. You have been a great audience. That's another show, I think. But anyway, you know what I mean, right? See you again for next Digital Classroom. And that's the one that's going to be on Fiber. Uh, let's hope. <laughs> See you again next time. Bye, guys.